All right, thank you very much, Isaiah. Welcome into the round table. And shipping has changed quite a bit in the last three or so years or so. And uh, joining us to talk about it for a little bit here, Dr. Sal Mercagliano joining us from Bowie's Creek, North Carolina. And uh, first off, Sal, uh, before we get to kind of the, the crux of what we're going to talk about here today, I wanted to get your opinion on the announcement that came out this morning uh, concerning the Biden administration trying to get a greater hold on the supply chain and basically kind of, I mean, involving numerous, numerous cabinet positions in terms of streamlining and making things more efficiently and how that will affect shipping, especially coming into the country. Yeah, it's a huge announcement, Bill. I mean, the story you have from Lorianne LaRocco is great. Uh, if you go to the w White House webpage, and what they're talking about is really building on that supply chain resiliency task force that they had set up during the crisis as it happened. Uh, I actually happened to run into General Steve Lyons not too long ago at a conference, and you know he's still the port czar. And I asked him what he's been up to, and this is one of the things he's been up to, is really working on setting this up. And as you mentioned, you're looking at multiple elements that are going to be put in place here. You're looking at a council on supply chain resiliency. That's going to be across department lines. I mean, you're talking about all the major executive department branches will be involved in that. You're talking about agreements across international lines. Uh, you're talking about flow. We're talking about freight logistics oversight. Uh, we're talking about data talking about port transparency. I mean, so all those elements that we saw happen during the supply chain crisis are all seeming now to come together under this one big banner that the Biden administration just released, which is a great thing because one of the big questions I had post the supply chain crisis is, all right, are we going to learn the lessons from what happened during the supply chain crisis? And it looks like that the Biden administration is trying to put some muscle behind that and actually create a system whereby we're catching that information and perhaps trying to make some reforms. What do you think is going to be the effect of this on shipping on a day-to-day -day basis, or really are we going to see it for, in terms of, you know, from the naked eye as we look at the shipping world? I, I think for us, it, it's more not so much on the, on the shipping on the boat side as much as it's going to be on the shipper side on being able to get more visibility, more information uh, from the ports, from the shipping firms. I think that's going to be the really key thing that we're going to see. Remember, the issue we had back in 2021, 2022 wasn't a shortage of ships. I had plenty of ships. I had more ships than we knew what to do with. The problem really became is the system got so clogged that we weren't able to efficiently move things. And the way you fix that is through information. That's really one of the keys. You can, of course, build more ports and more roads and more rail. That's great. But if you can make your information flow better, that's what they're trying to do. And the problem is a lot of this has been proprietary. It's been very siloed. And if you look at what the federal government did, for example, to get uh, states to accept federal money for highways by raising the drinking age, you know, this is the, one of the ways the federal government was able to leverage things is they would withhold federal funding unless you raise the drinking age. Well, there's a lot of money that's in port infrastructure right now. And so they're going to leverage the ports. They're going to leverage the companies to make their information more transparent with the hope to eliminate a lot of the detention and demerge we saw that was happening during the supply chain crisis. Of course, you have a lot of different variables that are going to be looked at. Obviously, there during the supply chain crisis, you had other variables that are not necessarily present now, uh, labor disputes being one of them, for instance. Uh, but one of the things that I know we're taking a very close look at in terms of how it th it's, it's disrupting it is the Panama Canal in terms of what it's doing, in terms of the water level that's in that lake that, uh, that needs to be at a certain level for those large ships at max capacity to get through. What are you seeing right now as being the real crux of that? particular issue and how it's affecting shipping going east to west and west to east trying to get trying to not essentially go around the horn or go through the Suez. Yeah, I, I wouldn't rule out labor disputes. We've got the ILA contracts that are coming up by November of next year, so that's going to be there. But the Panama Canal, obviously, is the low water levels. Again, remember, what we're seeing right now is that Panama had a very dry season. This is supposed to be the wet season, so they didn't get the rain they were expected. They're heading into the dry season with water levels in the canal that are lower than they typically are at the end of the dry season. And what the canal is doing is husbanding their water, which means they have to cut the number of passages 
passes through the canal. And so we're seeing a couple of things happen right now. Number one, we're seeing a bidding war on slots in the Panama Canal. Matter of fact, Panama Canal Authority just announced that you're going to be able to bid on additional slots to get through the canal now if you're waiting more than 10 days. So they're expecting, we're, we're expected by February 1st to see the Panama Canal at 50% reduction of the total number of ships. You're talking about going from 36 ships down to about 16 to 18 ships and only five ships through the large Neo Panamax lane. And what this is doing is forcing American ships coming out of the Gulf Coast to head east as opposed to heading west through the Panama Canal. This is LNG carriers that are going to be heading to Europe instead of heading to Asia. This is grain carriers that may actually be heading to Asia either via the Suez Canal or take a little extra detour. It's actually not that much further. It's only about two or three days further to head south around the southern tip of South America, the Cape of Good Hope, and head over to Asia that way, especially with the issues we're seeing right now at the southern end of the Red Sea, the Bab el Mandab with uh, the Houthi and the Yemenis uh, grabbing ships and attacking ships right now. Yeah, I was just about to bring that up. Of course, we're talking about environmental concerns with the Panama Canal. You're talking about geopolitical concerns uh, in, in the other areas of the country, and the other areas of the world, not necessarily, again, connected to what you can control within a government interface. What do you see as that particular situation as that unfolds? And again, hopefully kind of doesn't necessarily expand a path to what it's doing at the moment. Well, what we're seeing right now is uh, out of Yemen is attacks against ships that have Israeli ownership. And so obviously there's a network in Yemen that is providing information, probably from the Iranians, that are providing information to target vessels coming through the area with that Israeli ownership. And we've already seen one ship that was grabbed, the Galaxy Leader, this was last week. And then we saw an attack on a ship, the Central Park, which was thwarted. And actually we're getting reports that the U.S. and perhaps the Japanese maritime defense self uh, self defense force actually helped in the capture of those vessels but then a subsequent report coming out of US central command saying that Yemen shot two ballistic missiles at an American destroyer you have over 100 ships a day to go through the Bab el-Mandeb heading up to the Red Sea or out into the Gulf of Aden. This is a heavily trafficked area. And now what we're seeing is potential attacks. Now, are we going to see shipping stop going through here? No. As long as the attacks are focused on Israeli-owned vessels, other ships are going to keep passing through there without a problem. However, these these styles of attacks can spread. They can you know target other ships by accident, that could be increased insurance rates, and we may see vessels begin to divert. We've already seen some Israeli-owned vessels take the diversion route around Africa. So again, what this would mean is higher transportation costs, disruptions, delays coming in. Add this to a huge storm we just had up on the Black Sea that's disrupted shipping coming out of the Black Sea. We're, we're just seeing a lot of issues hitting against global shipping at these key maritime choke points. So when you look at these situations, and especially in view of what the Biden administration is unveiling at this particular time, how effective do you think this is going to be? Obviously, they can't control the weather and they can't control geopolitical uh, conflict uh, across the globe there. But is this going to be something that will be effective in the long term? Or do you think this will be lots of sound and fury signifying nothing, if you will? No, I, I think it's really important that the Biden administration do this because, again, if you look at U.S. ports, they're typically rated as, as some of the, you know, just the most inefficient ports. It takes a lot of time to move cargo through U.S. ports. And so if we can make our ports more efficient, then that increases our ability to absorb these shocks. Remember, what happened in the, in the supply chain crisis was a, was a shock. I mean, it was a shock to the system. All of a sudden, everybody sat at home and started ordering more stuff. That meant we went up several percentage points in terms of of goods coming in. The system wasn't designed to take a lot of shocks. And what we're trying to do is build some resiliency into this. Even if the Bob el Mandeb closed tomorrow, there's the routing around Africa you can go to. It's expensive, it involves more ships, it delays cargo coming in, but it's really important to understand that there has to be backup systems in place. And I think one of the things we're seeing by the Biden administration looking at the supply chain crisis is realize that we got into a just-in-time style of supply chain. And what we really need is to develop almost a supply web where we're not dependent on the weakest link in the chain. Instead, you know, you can lose several threads in a web and still maintain its strength. That's what they're starting to look at, which is well, well it's, it's, it needed to be done long before this.
We got about 45 seconds left here. So as we turn the calendar to 2024, what's your main concern with shipping in terms of how it gets through, again, with these new details involved? I, I think we're looking at choke points again. I, I think, you know, if we don't see any appreciable water into the Panama Canal, that's going to have a big impact. Where does that L American LNG go? Is it going to go to Europe, which we know Europe needs LNG because of Russia-Ukraine war? But at the same time, does that mean U.S. lose its marketplace to countries like Australia and Qatar? It's a big issue for grain getting out. We're already seeing low water levels in the Mississippi, which we hadn't even talked about. That's yeah. causing a, a reduction in grain coming out and routing ships that that long way and again it's a real big question here about what do the freight rates begin to do in 2024 when it comes to LNG to uh, grain to containers a uh, lot of questions coming into the new year Dr. Sal Mercagliano once again proving that shipping is nothing if not boring as, as on a tremendous level you guys you have stories every day coming out on uh, your, your channel there as well Sal thanks so much for joining us uh, it's great to see you Bill thanks for having me back all right, we will take a short break. Wrap up this edition of Freight Waves now after this.